So my first job is to welcome John Brady, my, my good friend, to our blog and podcast, which we call uh, The Sport. And you are allocated this grand title of being today's sporting genie. How does that make you feel, John? I mean, I'm, I, it's, 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 you know, it sounds good, doesn't it? And, you know, if I am a sporting genie, I'll take that. that, that that's that's not, not a bad title to have. So I'll have it. I'll take it. Um, I think people might say, and it's a bit unfair, but they might say you've got the, the perfect face for radio. Is, <laughs> is that what they say about you? They certainly say that about me. <laughs> I, I'm I'm so much better on uh, you know when you can't see my face. I've I've, I've always been I've always said that myself. Never mind anything else. <laughs> so yeah. For those, who, for those who have not had this distinguished career of knowing you as a friend, um, you're a big fella, aren't you? I'm a huge fella. It doesn't show when I'm sitting down as well. So normally, you know, the last <laughs> the last twelve months of Zoom, no one's known that I'm six foot nine, and you know, so how tall are you? Six six foot nine. You are six foot nine. Yeah, well, I mean, it's six foot eight and three quarters, but you know, uh, I, I stopped counting the, you know, or, or rounded it up when I was about thirteen. So we, we just go for six foot nine now, and it looked it looked better in the basketball programs as well. You know that. So you're, you're officially the the biggest person that I've uh, stood beside in the sporting world because prior to you, it was a gentleman called Kevin Francis. Does that name ring any bells with you? Super Kevin Francis. Yeah, oh, yeah. Do you yeah. remember him? I did, yeah, well, I, I was a, a home and away guy at Stockport County at that stage. I even I oh. even was lucky enough to go out uh, on a night out with Kevin and uh, Tony Dinning and a couple of other guys that, that used to play at Stockport. See, I, I knew there was something in your DNA. That, that must be yeah. why we've been attracted to each other, being a, a lifelong County fan myself. Have I not even mentioned that I was the mascot for Stockport County when I was 10? Um, no. Did you have to dress up as a bear? <laughs> Vernon? <laughs> <laughs> No, the, the best bit was, so I was, what was it? I must have been 10 because I was at primary school. And as I was running off the pitch, and I was already about 5 foot 10, 5 foot 11 at this stage, I'd got people at the side of the pitch trying to get my autograph thinking it was a new player. And I'm going, I'm 10 years old. You know, it was it. <laughs> they were great days. That's when they used to have the you know the, the pit at the front of the main stand where oh, the away fans well. used to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're all showing our age now when we refer oh, back absolutely, to things like absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, uh I mean, I, I think I know, but uh, and the clue might be in your height. But um, for those people that don't know John Brady, wh what what is your sporting CV? What, what are the <laughs> highest accolades in your sporting world? And have you played in a variety of sports, or have you uh, largely been attracted to one main one? Uh, I would. It, it, it was a <laughs> it was a varied uh, and very average uh, club football team that I played in. Uh, whose who's claim to fame was there was a kid in, who was our striker who was in Johnny Briggs, the, the, the BBC TV show for a bit. Uh, then I went to play, uh, I played one game for uh, Manchester Rugby Club up here, and it was in Buxton and it was like the middle of November or whenever it was. So we were actually playing in about a foot and a half of snow. Um, and this, this, this must have been when I was about, it must have been about 11 or 12-ish. So I, I, it was, the, the rugby was okay, but it wasn't really for me, you know, it was, I, and I remember, I think it was after a training session at Grove Lane, and my mum had come to pick me up, and we were walking past the first team pitch, just as the first team captain's teeth went flying past, uh, without him attached to them, and there, 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 there was an element of my mum going, I'm not sure this is for you, anyway... As it happens, uh, you, you know, my fantastic PE teacher at school, Mr. Lloyd, uh, got me into playing basketball. Uh, so when I was 12, I was already, what was a six foot two when I was 12. There was a picture of me on the back of the, the messenger with two kids of my, the, 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 the same age as me, who I was obviously dwarfing, you know, they were, they, they were uh, considerably smaller. And then I got a phone call. Uh, and I don't know how this happened. I don't know how he managed to get my number, but it was the coach of uh, the under, I think it was the under 16s at Manchester United, as it was, uh, basketball club. And that's where it all started, really. So I played for, I played for Manchester, uh, for, the, for all the junior teams at Manchester, made it into the senior team uh, under Jeff Jones and uh, played, a, played a bit for England as well. So I played England under 15s and 17s. Um, but uh, predominantly domestic stuff, really. So I ended up uh, working for the Giants in the, in the long run for seven years when they moved into the arena uh, and cut short my playing career because it was that thing between, you, you know, do you want to 
do you want to carry on playing for a pair of ballet gear trainers every year or do you want to go and earn a living so uh earning a living with a bit of recreational basketball on the side happened that that must have been about when i was about 23. And you mentioned Jeff Jones. Jeff, Jeff Jones presumably is Callum's dad, I'm guessing. That is correct, yes. Uh, so, so, so Jeff so, used to play for United. When I first started, he was like the American import. He, he was an unbelievable player um, in, a, in a fantastic Manchester United team as well that played in Europe and all kinds of things. And, and so, did so is he okay. still, I mean, he, to my knowledge, I think he's coach at, um, is he not coach at uh, Manchester Metropolitan? University yeah, he's the, the Mystics team. The, yeah, uh, I, I think it's the, what was. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit out of the loop on that one at the minute, but uh, I think they're still connected to the Manchester Basketball Club and and you know and so on. But Jeff, yeah, Jeff's coaching the, coaching the senior women's team at, uh, at Mystics at the moment. And yeah, Callum so his is, sons Callum. are James and Callum. Yeah, yeah, Callum's at Sharks now. I don't, I don't know about. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, Small yeah, world over there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially so, so I mean, you, you are a, a multi-sports fanatic, but, but 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 basketball is the one that's closest to your heart. Is it? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the one. Of, uh, you know, <laughs> I bore the people that were rigid with you know when I played basketball. You know, it's just like <laughs> it's like my catchphrase. Or when I was involved with basketball, we did this, and it's just you know, people just go, oh god, not again. So yeah, but basketball's my, I'd say my first, yeah. First thing, and obviously there's the football stuff as well. That you know, I'm a more an absolute spectator more than a player. Uh, but yeah, as, as long as it's sport, I'm I'm okay with it. And Manchester United basketball did that just cease after a while? Yeah, it was. It, I think I played two seasons as Manchester United before it went to Manchester Eagles. And if I remember the story correctly, there was a director. There was a director at the football club as well as as the basketball club and he was getting a bit of stick because it was costing it was effectively costing the football club something like 300 grand a year to run the basketball and at that time you could buy a decent player for 300 grand or it'd go somewhere towards you know uh, whereas that's probably a week's wages now but at that time and I think it was a bit embarrassing as well because that that was in the middle of Man United slump, uh, and our first team were parading around the football pitch with all the trophies they were winning. So it was kind of like, hang on a minute, what's what's going on here? Um, so Man United ended up uh, ended up pulling out, and uh, I think it was a guy called David Kay came in and with with Jeff as well. I think Jeff was involved and. And basically started uh, the Master Eagles. Still playing out. We played out at Stretford Sports Centre. Um, same setting, more or less same players, give or take a few. Um, and it, it just it, it changed that before it morphed back into Giants eventually. And are you uh, are you keeping a watchful eye on the Giants? Because obviously they've had a change in ownership in the last 12 months. As mm. you know, I was working there on the, the previous owners for 12 months and thoroughly mm. enjoyed myself and my first real taste of basketball. But I, I got the buzz in that time. Yeah, I think because I've, I've, I've spoke with Jamie several times uh, around his his plans for everything that's going on with Giants, and it just seems really exciting at the moment. I think with uh, with them moving into Bellevue as well and being able to get that many people, hopefully, eventually, in to watch a game, and you know everything that's going on there. I think I think there's there's good times, good times ahead. Even some you know they, they, I know they've just missed out on the playoffs, but you know results seem to be getting a little bit closer. So I know they've done well against some of the big boys. I think they've got, is it Lions tonight or something like, you know, who are, who are made up of something like 20 X NBA players or <laughs> however they've managed that. But yeah, so I, I still keep in touch with it. And I can't say I've been to that many games. I think the last Giants game I actually went to was at Wright Robinson and I never, I never went to Wormston. Um which is strange because that's where I played my first senior game. I think was way back when when you know Jeff was coaching. I can't even remember what we were. Called. I think we were LA Gear Manchester Giants by that time. Um, yeah, so I played a couple of games or a couple of seasons at, at Ermston, but never never got to see the this this formation of the Giants at Ermston. So and it's only just around the corner as well. So well, I'd like to well, hopefully it's, but, it's not been too derogatory, but I'd like to su suggest that you didn't miss much at Ermston. It was uh, yeah, it was phenomenal <laughs> in terms of crowd atmosphere and quite often the opposition teams used to say it was some of the loudest uh, venues that they played in but yeah considering this is the uh, elite level sport elite mm. level basketball in mm. the bbl yeah. british basketball league it was a shoddy facility so bellevue's yeah. got to be a 
a godsend. Oh, and the, the access it gives you to commercial income from hospitality, etc., is yeah. something that was never available at Ermston. Yeah. And I don't think Ermston had been updated. I, I remember going to a, it was a Trafford uh, sports development uh, do that was there. It was, I think it was their sports awards and walked into the building. And this is going back a little bit, probably about five, six years ago, walked into this place and it was exactly the same <laughs> as, it, as it had been when I, when I played there, you know, down to the decor and everything. So yeah, it was a bit, yeah. I mean, that's what was available at the time. So John did his best with that. So, uh, you know, and I know he had plans to, to redevelop it and so on. Um, but ultimately Bellevue's where, where they've got to play. They, they've Absolutely. got to be there. Absolutely. And when people uh, start to interrogate and do some research into who this John Brady character is, mm-hmm. um, uh, apart from the fact you clearly are greater sport, mm-hmm. um, the, the three letters that come up, uh, at least the, the nice three letters I can think of, <laughs> are CSP. So uh, greater sport is a CSP. There'll be a lot of people listening to this podcast that won't have a clue what a CSP uh-huh. is. So what is greater sport and what is a CSP? <laughs> That's a really good question. Is that one of the trick questions you were talking about? No, no, about? no. This so, is, this is, I'm starting with the easy ones, John. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so um, we are um, we're now an active partnership. We've had a, we've had an update uh, from CSP. So we look after the whole of Greater Manchester. So uh, we work under the so there is a, a blueprint for sport and physical activity across Greater Manchester called GM Moving, and we are basically the one of the engine rooms within GM Moving. So how do we help the um, the population of Greater, Greater Manchester live a more active, you know, lifestyle? Um, you know, we, and we're talking about, you know, <clears throat> front and centre of things like walking, cycling, those kind of things, and, you know, active travel. Uh, my work particularly is around active workplaces and, and how, we, um, how we get, uh, activity into a health and well-being plan so all these businesses at the moment are talking about um you know supporting their their staff's health and well-being how do we get a little bit of activity into that day to help with that so whether it is getting outside and enjoying the the weather when it comes back again um with a walk or a cycle or something like that but then also working you know when i first joined great uh, great sport it was about working with the national governing bodies of sport so from the FA to wrestling and, and, you know, basketball and volleyball and everybody in between. So, um, you know, it's got a huge remit. Um, you know, I'm part of the active adults team. So, you know, our, our work's predominantly around, you know, working with veterans, working with workplaces, working with older adults. We've got our CYP team, which is anything to do with children, and young people, schools, uh, colleges, uh, you know, it, 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 our, our remit's huge. Um, and, and it covers it covers quite a lot, but it's you know it wouldn't be possible without the help of of partners that we work with, and um, you know we all work together to 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 make sure that the the message of GM moving goes across the whole of um, the whole of Greater Manchester, and then we're we're part of a wider network um, of partnerships, one in each one in each county basically, but uh, we're probably one of the big boys because we're, we're in one of the biggest you know the highest population areas so uh, that's probably ourselves birmingham uh, yorkshire london are the are probably the the big guys and then on a professional basis i was honored i think the, the only time we have sh- uh, shared a stage was that you were a key participant in an event that i ended up chairing at sedulo mm-hmm. uh, very impressive uh, uh, business advisors and accountants in manchester mm-hmm. and we ran an event at the time, it was aimed at um, uh, chief execs, directors of the national governing bodies, but that seemed to be very well received. It was a good audience there on the day, and I know you had some uh, good input on a variety of issues, mm. not least social impact in sport. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the thing with, you know, with, again, with us being Greater Manchester, we're blessed that the national governing bodies of sport, big clubs, w- want to work, want to work in that field, and it's. And it's coming round now because, you know, the things that we were talking about at that event are starting to happen. So, you know, it, it's not sport for sport's, uh, sport's sake anymore. You know, it's we can't just focus on, you know, the elite athlete or the, the you know, the, the next tier down from that, the, the guy or, or girl that wants to, you know, play at a fairly decent level. It's about how can sport have an impact on, you know, we're doing some work in Beswick just over the road from the Etihad and, and sport plays a really key part in that. And it may be that, 
you know, somebody, you know, maybe not the world's greatest footballer, but how do they then work with Man City, for example, on, on a walking route and, and feel part of the club that way? So they don't have to necessarily be the world's greatest sports person, but there's another way of, of utilising the idea of sport to, to, to sort of motivate people to be a little bit more active. And that's starting to come round and the work we're doing with, with One Manchester is very much about that and how we engage with communities and um, use the, the power of sport and clubs and NGBs to, to, to do that. Um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be really important going forward. Sport England's new strategy is pretty much all about that, um, and, and and tackling the <clears throat> the inequalities that exist as well. You know, and you know, there's the, the just so many uh, to go at. And, and when you look into the stats through you know active lives or or wherever, it, it's quite telling that you know that there's a real problem um, with people not being as active as they probably should be. But I think you know I'm going to come back to you on uh, something that we're looking at uh, collaboratively, possibly in relation to one Manchester with the, mm. one of my clients in mm -hmm. the, the East Manchester at the moment. So we're, yeah. we'll continue to touch base on that. But one of the, 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 the sort of the key thrusts and one of the key things that I wanted to give you a platform for today was that you, it's so topical because obviously it's, it's been a year or a year plus different from anything any of us have experienced in our lives before mm. and you have got some opinions and some views about the impact of covid mm -hmm. um the beauty for me in talking to you john is that you're really well connected and you work well with all the different types of stakeholders in sport and in that sporting landscape which is great but let, let's just give you this platform just to share with the audience that's here um about what your take is about the current scenario, but also some of the limitations and perhaps things that could be done, or at least your opinion on the way that things could be done in terms of getting out and getting into a better place than we are now. Yeah, and I think, <clears throat> you know, you know, we, we've spoken before about this. It's, you know, it's the role of, you know, to go back to sport, it is the role of you know, sport in particular. How do we utilise local sports clubs? How do we utilise the national governing bodies? How, how do we use all of these these venues that are out there at the moment to help people get back into the world after this is you know not even as it's it's all over i mean we're, we're getting to the stage now where the restrictions are starting to, to fall away and you know it's great to see more and more people out there but yeah for me sports clubs are going to be a, an absolutely fundamental part of that and you know the flip side of it is they've really really suffered during you know lockdowns and not being able to get members into their clubs, you know, and, and and so many clubs are struggling right now. So it's how do we how do we continue to support or grow the support for local sports clubs? You know, and that and that that for me is going to be going to be a huge thing. There's also a part around you know businesses and, and the work I'm doing with with the workplace stuff. And yeah there's gonna there's gonna be you know, a real, well, there has to be a growth in the, in, in the sort of productivity and it's how we go about that productivity. Is it, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday and, and, and their concern was that we'll, we'll just try and get more blood out of the stone rather than trying to make a, a workplace a happy place to be, which in turn then creates that productivity by, you know, going back to the health and well-being stuff and, and you know, including activity into that. How, how can we utilise again, sport activity to then boost productivity without turning around to organisations or organisations turning around to their staff and going, we need more out of you, we need more out of you. How can we do what we're doing at the moment but make it better? So that they're, they're probably my two biggest things at the minute. Businesses have got a huge part to play. But then, you know, as a, as a network, how do we support clubs to be able to do what they're going to be able to do you know from your point of view from you know a volleyball point of view you know are are you going to see an influx of, of more people wanting to play volleyball and if so how are you going to be able to do that you know where where's the funding going to come from for that where's the facilities going to come from for that and and how 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 do, as a network can we support you to do that we use the word network and you, you could also use the word possibly food chain because there's, there's so many different stakeholders and at different levels within sport. Mm. Um, I mean, is the setup right at the moment? Have we got the right players in that ecosystem that can 
help sport bounce back properly or does there need to be a, a real shake up within that uh, sporting stakeholders mapping at the moment i think i think all the pieces are probably there it, it's just you know one of the really great things about you know gm moving is how it has, has done that and how it has it's become a real collaborative approach to people being active. And sometimes I wonder whether sports got the same thing. And yeah, you know, I'll put my basketball hat on and, and I go, I look at basketball and it's just so fragmented. You know, it's, it, it's one of the reasons that I, I probably haven't been as involved as I, as I used to be, is it just got so frustrating watching people battle each other rather than, you know, supporting each other, knowing, knowing their part in the part in the system to support each other, you know, and, and I can put my hands up and go, I, I, I was at fault there because, <laughs> yeah, as a, as a leader within a basketball club, I, I split from my basketball club and went and set up another one, you know, because I didn't like the philosophy of the old club. And all that happens is you just dilute the talent pool. And, and that, that, that same mentality is what is, is stopping it's probably stopping basketball going from where it needs to go because, you know, as soon as someone disagrees, you know, it, it, it all, it all falls apart and they go and form a new club. And I suppose it's just, it, it, in not, a, not a harsh way, but it, it's probably similar in the sporting network. And it depends where you are in greater Manchester, depending on what kind of support you get, you know, so some boroughs are, are fantastic at their club support. Others, you know, they haven't got the capacity and not, from no fault of their own, they just don't have the capacity to be able to support support clubs in the way that some of the others do. So it's a bit of a lottery from that point of view. So there needs to be something really from a from a GM uh, GM angle about how how that continues to or, or how we put those wheels in motion to help support that. You know, and, and there's a COVID call every I think it's every Tuesday at the moment where all the local authorities, the NGBs, are involved in it. So that's starting to happen. Um, you know, so that there, there are talks about how, how, as a network, we can support clubs to, to get back on the feet and get back up and running. Um, and just even things like roadmaps. Yeah, you, look you... At, you look at some roadmaps, you know, I, I think about my sport, basketball. Yeah. Basketball England have done an absolutely fantastic job of their roadmap. All I ever hear are people saying what a great job they've done. And it's so clear and so concise. And we, you know, everyone knows exactly where they are. Yeah, and not every sport probably has that that same capacity to be able to do that. I think you're right. I mean, I'm interested because I mean, for a lot of people who've been hit very badly, particularly grassroots sport, the first thing in terms of sustainability is is how does the income come in? It might be from mm -hmm. lack of membership. It might be from lack of commerciality and sponsorship and partnerships during these last twelve months. Um, you see plenty of calls out there from the likes of Sporting. And so there was a return to play. Mm -hmm. There was the, the small grants, which could have had a COVID theme. And then there's potential match funding with the, the crowd funder. That's uh, another thing that can contribute, contribute towards capital costings. Mm -hmm. Do you get any, any visibility or do you get to have any knowledge about how many clubs are actually taking up the option of applying to these uh, pots? Not particularly. I mean, not not that it comes knocking on my door particularly. Um, I think that the, the issue you've probably got is there are a lot of clubs looking for funding, and there's not enough, there's not probably not enough funding to go around everybody. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I was talking to a guy yesterday who used to be a business lecturer at Leeds University, and we we were talking about clubs and uh, one of the things we spoke about was exactly what you just mentioned there around yeah you, you talk to some clubs about you know you need to be a little bit more business-like you need to think about you know your incomes and your expenditures and your commercial streams and all these kind of things like, oh no we're not that we're not that kind of club but the problem is it's just then you know the funding's not there to help them either so you know these clubs are going close to you know close to the wall but again, where, where are they getting the support from to, to start thinking a little bit more commercially? And we're not, we're not saying that they're going to be the next you know, Wolf of Wall Street, but we're, we're saying you know, there, are, there are simple things you can put into place um, to help you know, increase that revenue and, and help. You know, it, it's not you profiteering, it's, it's you being able to support your club to, to cover the cost that you've got. 
you know, and I'm, I'm preaching to converted with you because I know that, you know, sponsorship and everything is your, is your thing. So, but, you know, all, all these things that, you know, there's a huge football club near me and, you know, it, they, I just think they're missing a trick every time I walk around there. There's hundreds of kids on that, that, that field on a Saturday, Sunday morning. And I don't see anything that says, you know, sponsored by such and such a body because they're, they're a sponsor's dream, these, these clubs, you know. So, but then again, it's knowledge, isn't it? Where do they get the knowledge from to to know how to even go about that? It's a tricky one, and and, and I don't claim to be an expert because, as I say, you have much more day to day involvement with the various stakeholders. But I just remember from the, from the sake of watching my own uh, children that uh, going back three to four weeks ago and uh, playing the first sport outdoors and the children playing sport together the parents socially distanced watching from the, the sidelines mm. um it, it was phenomenal and they all needed it it was the lift they needed the goodness it must have done to mental health uh oh, absolutely, you, yeah. you, you witness it yourself yeah but then at the same time and i do hear about a few funding successes i don't know how many people are tapping into it but you're talking about your sport i'm talking about the sport that i happen to be a chairman of mm. if you just look at this last week and i don't wish to be all gloom and doom but um uh, there was a club in the West Midlands in volleyball that have had to pull out of the, the final eight for the under 15s because they wished us all luck. But they said, Look, we're struggling to go outdoors, never mind indoors. There's nobody letting us have any indoor court space now or in the future. And obviously, um, uh, under uh, 18s are still permissible to have gone back under uh, the Volleyball England guidelines. Um, in the same way, there's a, a club just on the way to, to Cheshire that we're on the way to Chester that we're very friendly with, mm. and they've got they're given no indication whatsoever when they can ever go back indoors. Yeah, and what a situation that is. And then I'm telling you about my own situation today mm. is frustration, and mm. uh, I'm, I'm being told that uh, I can have these slots, but I can't physically have a five set match within the time frame they're giving us. So, mm. yeah. There's frustrations out there and you, you just hope that whilst you get this massive buzz to be back there in, in return to play, you do need a little bit of hand-holding and a little bit of flexibility or agility or whatever the word might be just to get people back there and, and hopefully give everybody that lift that they all deserve and need. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, when I talk about that, that the football club over the road from us, the, the, the happy noise that was coming from those pitches you know, for the last couple of weekends now is fantastic, you know, and to see the, you know, <laughs> at first there was a sort of anxiety about it, but now it's like, great, fantastic. You drive past and you can see literally hundreds of people having a great time. They're back out, they're doing what they want to do. But, you know, it's, it's you know, we, we've spoke about this as well. You know, the, the, the issue, the issue comes down to just, we've got a lack of facilities and as a, as indoor sports as well. So if I put my basketball hat back on again, you know, basketball has, has struggled not only with a, a lack of indoor space, but also the cost of indoor space, you know, it, it's, it just doesn't weigh up as far as, uh, you know, a, a, a small basketball club or a volleyball club or whoever being able to afford those, those costs. But that, that then comes down to that thing again about commerciality and, and how do you, you know, how do we, how do we put in place the right mechanisms to be able to, you know, uh, to fund that? But it does come down, I mean, it, and we spoke before about, you know, if you go into Europe, this just simply, you know, just simply isn't a problem. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, and my basketball club, for example, and your volleyball club would probably be in the same club. We'd be a sporting club and we'd all be working together. We'd be sharing a fan base. We'd be sharing a commercial person, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, and we'd be stronger, stronger as a result of it, wouldn't we? Absolutely, yeah. And 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 you know, my missus, who's French, always goes on about it when she was um, she was a gymnast for the local club, but they they had their own radio station, they had their own facilities, they had uh, I say their own facilities, you know, again, local authority facilities, but. You know, the football club, the volleyball club, the basketball club, uh, the handball club, you name it, gymnastics club, were all part of the same thing. They all supported each other to the point of we went there, it must have been about 10 years ago now. And on one day, it started with uh, the handball club played first, the volleyball club then came on and then the basketball club finished off the day. And, and, and the fans just sat in the stands all day. You know, they paid one fee to get in to watch the, all three games all at national league level and you know just total different totally different mentality towards it 
Well, I think that, I think you hit the nail on the head with that word mentality, mentality and uh, and drive to do something different. I mean, what you're describing is second nature to me. I mean, look at these last few weeks and uh, Galatasaray, Fenerbahce, uh, FC Barcelona, mm-hmm. Stoya Bucharest in Romania, all of them multi-sports clubs yeah, and absolutely. feeding off each other, yeah. hopefully to have a, a sustainable future. Sometimes the accounts are kept separate for different sporting units, but th- there's something, some good can come of that conglomerate mm-hmm. approach. Yeah. And we've tried it here. Man United tried it, you yeah. know, uh, going back. It, we, there was a, I think there was a volleyball team. Um, I've, yeah, I've seen the CV of somebody who applied to us and I thought, yeah. Manchester United volleyball, what's that all about? But yes, yeah. you're right, there was at one point. Yeah, so there was the basketball, there was volleyball, there was the football club. I think there were other things. Um, but then, you, you know, the other one was Newcastle United. So Newcastle United had the, I think they had the, the was it Falcons rugby? They certainly had the rugby and the football, didn't they? I don't know about yeah, the Yeah, and there was yes. a basketball team out of there as well. I, I think they might have been ice hockey. So it has been tried, but for some reason, it, it just doesn't it doesn't take here for, for whatever reason. But again, like you say, if Real Madrid and Barcelona can do it, yeah. plus all do those the, um, I, I've not seen the numbers, but since I left basketball a year ago... Um, a deal was done with Sky Sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, it's nothing remotely resembling the deal <laughs> that will have been done with the English Premier League. But yeah, yeah. Like is that sizable to any degree billion. that that might drip feed down into grassroots basketball? Or is it just enough to cover some of the expenses of the BBL teams? I, I don't think it'll drip down. I mean, I, I remember going back, and again, going back to my involvement in the Giants in the 90s, I know that, uh, I see, I've just done my catchphrase, you know, uh, my involvement in the Giants. Um, did you used to play basketball? I, I don't know if I ever mentioned it, but yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but Sky, I think we actually used to pay Sky to come and do the BBL games, you yeah. know, and uh, and brilliantly as well, by the way. You know, it, it, ultimately it's great to get on, on television, but as far as a... <laughs> a Premier League style funding package that's not nowhere near nowhere near but the thing is you know when you talk about grassroots so again around here we are probably the strongest at grassroots basketball anywhere in the country you know with the we've got the magic but we're the only you know, the magic and mystics but we're the only area I think in in the country that has something like five or six purpose-built basketball facilities you know mm. we've got Stockport, Berry, Oldham, you know, uh, Wally Range. Uh, now we've got the Performance Centre at, at Bellevue. No one else can come anywhere near that, you know. Absolutely. And, and the number of kids that are going through those those centres is is phenomenal. You know, another another part of my life was working at one of them, and you know, it was something like three hundred basketball teams, you know, taking part in leagues every single week, and that was just in one building. Brilliant. So, you know, there are thousands and thousands of kids playing basketball. There are thousands and thousands of adults playing basketball, you know, as well in Greater Manchester. So we're in a real hotbed. And that's that's really why, you know, the, the frustration is that, you know, why, why are we not doing better? Well, John Brady, it's been, a, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. But before I let you escape completely... Uh, mm-hmm. You've achieved a lot. I'm glad you're on my network. I'm glad you're on my circuit. I'm glad our paths are going to keep crossing into the future. You've achieved so much in your career to date. Uh, I've absolutely no doubt you will go on to achieve uh, even more things as time progresses. But uh, leave me with uh, a final word of inspiration. Uh, this will give you a few minutes just to uh, think about this one. Who, If you had to think back to one or a couple of people that you've met in the sporting world, it might have been a uh, a fellow teammate, it might have been an athlete that you watched, it might have been a coach, it might have been something for an NGB, who knows? If you had to pick on one or two people, who have had a profound effect on your career and your motivation and drive that uh, you would pick out of the hat? So three people instantly come to mind. I don't know Good. if that's the right answer. So the yep. first one uh, is, is Martin Lloyd, who was my PE teacher at Cheadle Hume High School. This guy's a hero. This, yeah, and up until recently, I was still in touch with him. And then he's retired, and we've not seen each other since. But so you were at Woods Lane. Yeah, Woods Lane. 
Yeah. There you go. See, I, I was the year that, that we weren't allowed to call it Woods Lane anymore. It had to be Chile. Uh, it's now the Loris Trust with the... Oh, is it? The, with the, the head of sport, one of the lead sporting ambassador there is mm. Paul Dickoff. It, is he really? He is indeed. Dear me, it really has gone downhill, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think the audience can tell who your affinity is. In the <laughs> I'm not, there's a song that goes along with it. I'm not saying it. Um, so... Um, so yeah, so Martin Lloyd, a bit, a massive shout out to Martin because he was, if it hadn't have been for him, because I wasn't a sporty kid at all, you know, I, I, I'd take or leave football, you know, I'd play it in the playground with my mates, but I just wasn't wasn't a football kid. I think, in fact, one of my mates at primary school was a guy called Gareth Worley, who ended up playing in the Premier League for Bradford, Wigan and goodness, I think he was at Cardiff as well, played like 500 games in the Premier League. And uh yeah, me and him were mates, and uh, you know, he was off playing for yeah. I think he played for Crew and you know, and so on. And great career, yeah. But it just me and him were chalk and cheese because I was like not interested in football. I remember getting a hand me down Man United shirt, and and that that was the only connection. Um, but yeah, so but if it hadn't have been for Martin, I would never have got involved in basketball because if it hadn't have been for him taking the time to get a, a leaflet to the Basketball School of Achievement that used to happen at Bramall High and coming into my English class to give it to me would never have happened. So so, so, so before you leave Cheadle Hume High School altogether, do you know uh, uh, a young man and uh, up and coming basketball player called Greg Wilde? I know the name. Yeah, he's a uh, he's, uh, former Cheadle Hume High School, Woods mm. Lane, mm. Uh, is now with, with Riders. Oh, is he really? Yeah, doing very well indeed. Uh, Good lad. A sporting family of, uh, I think from memory, three sons, but uh, mm. he's uh, certainly rocketing up that um, sporting continuum in terms of basketball. That's probably not me down the league table of basketball players that have come out of uh, <laughs> come out of Chile High School. Then well, well, next, time, next time I'm the there, time. if there's a piece of wood with your name on it that's fallen to the floor, I'll make sure I knock it back up there for you. Yeah, well, th there was a picture of me outside of the head teacher's office, but that that soon disappeared. Uh, and that <laughs> our story was I went to do so. Martin invited me back to do every year. They did a like. Um, you know, a sports awards type thing. And he invited yeah. me back to be the most, you know, the inspirational speaker of the night. And I was garbage. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. I can't believe that. You're so articulate on this podcast. I, I, well, it, it, it was, I think it was a bit of stage fright because it was in the main hall where I had had many a telling off actually at, <laughs> at school. So I don't know if it was just like fear or whatever. Anyway, so that's my number one, uh, Martin Lloyd. Number two is a guy called Steve Griffiths who was my first basketball coach at Man United, who took so much time uh, to, to set me up with the right basics. And, you know, he really, you know, really invested a lot of time into me and the rest of the team as well. But if it hadn't have been him, I wouldn't have had an enjoyable experience. With, with, with my real first experience of team basketball wouldn't have even, you know, uh, I'd done my stuff at the Basketball School of Achievement, which was brilliant. Thank you, Bob Greenoff. Uh, so I've now made it four people now. Uh, so Steve Griffiths, Steve Griffiths uh, was brilliant. Uh, he was an XPE teacher turned basketball coach, but he was um, he, he was fantastic. Another one is uh, I'm going to shout out to John Amici, and I've sometimes me and me and John, uh, probably unknown to him, haven't seen eye to eye, and you know, just some of you know, it, history, but. Remind what the world, I, I know who John Amici is, and uh, but remind the world for people that might not come from a basketball, basketball background, uh, who he was and what he went on to achieve in the game. So John uh, went on to play in the NBA. So uh, me and John are a couple of years apart, but played on the same under-16s team, I think it was. And sometimes I tell the story of two Johns. And there's, a, there's, a, there's one John that... <laughs> was a little bit lazy and took everything for granted. And there was another John that pushed himself and ended up playing in the NBA. I'll leave you to guess which one I was. Um, <laughs> um, but then, you know, uh, seeing him come back, doing what he did for, you know, uh, the basketball centre, uh, his involvement there, and um, and mo more recently, the work he's done around, you know, the, the anti-racist stuff and, just, just generally being an inspiration on whatever channel he's on. Absolutely. Uh, 
absolutely absolutely fantastic role model for for people and um you know i, I know many people have, have seen his podcasts and his you know uh jedi thinking or whatever he calls it on uh on linkedin you know it it's it's really good stuff and as so an as an aside is it it's no longer called the amici center is it no it's manchester basketball center now okay yeah. I don't know the ins and outs. <laughs> Nor do I. <laughs> Stay well clear. Um, yeah. So, so there's John, and then there's there's probably a, a you know a, a, I'm going to make it five with with a shout out to Joe Forber as well because um, again Joe uh, took me Danny Craven uh, and I think it was a guy called Chris Wilson he used to take us out to a high school in Warrington to basically drill the living daylights out of us in the summer to make sure that we were ready for um you know for the new seasons with you know all our big post moves and all the you know all this stuff so he did a lot of individual work with us as well so there's five people there for you adrian all five have been brilliant it's just nice to know that when i ask you if you, if you can name one or two we end up with five but uh <laughs> yeah, when, exactly. when were yeah. you ever to follow my simple instructions no i don't do that i don't do simple instructions <laughs> As John, many I've, of my employers will <laughs> testify to. <laughs> John, I've enjoyed listening to you and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to call you a friend and uh, I do wish you every success, whatever you go on to, but I'm grateful for you sharing it with the audience. Uh, at this point in the proceedings, I will press the magic button and uh, continue to talk to you, but uh, at this point I will uh, stop recording you. You'll be delighted to hear. Thank you, Adrian. I hope, hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been a, a lot of fun. We should do this again. <laughs>